Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Jesko from AcousticsInsider.com, where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals. I'm joined today by Mark and James from Present Day Production. Hello. Maybe you saw us do a video a while back on their channel, and they've just recently done something that literally broke my brain a bit when I started watching it. Um, uh, but maybe just first of all, thanks for joining me this morning. I know you guys are busy. I know you've got a, a very kind of busy schedule. So thanks for making the time and joining me today. Thanks Thank for having us. Yeah, thanks for asking us. It's great. It's great to be on your channel. We love the video we did with you last year. That was so much fun. Um, it was a lot so of fun. Yeah, yeah. So, and, so I, and we still haven't built the fish tank wall with the monitors. In I was it, really looking forward to we're, that. We're working on that. So. <laughs> Great, great. Um, and hopefully we'll have a lot of fun today as well. The reason that I wanted to jump on this call with you is a little selfish. Like I mentioned, it broke my brain a bit when I heard about what you guys did. But basically, in a nutshell, you decided to build your own mastering grade speaker for Dolby Atmos. Which is just like, yeah. why? What? <laughs> How? Hey, <laughs> what? Um, and... I'm still digesting all of this myself. I've kind of just binged through all the content you put out and I'm kind of digesting this myself. So there's a, so much stuff we could talk about. I'll, I'll try and narrow it down. Before we get started with that, obviously for anybody who's watching, I highly, highly recommend you watch the series that you guys put out uh, on designing, building, putting up, setting the speaker up together um, on your channel. So that's the present day production YouTube channel, and I'll link to the playlist for that series in the description. Um, again, it's really, really great. I think everybody, anybody who's not subscribed to your channel, what are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> Why? Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you. I think you guys have probably got one of the, the funnest and and um, most, it's like the, the mix of entertainment and education is just perfect. Um, and yeah, just a dose oh, of stupidity thrown in there. Thanks. Exactly. Yeah, well, I've... I've I've got a stupid sense of humour, and if if I get bored making the video, then I'm well. Everyone's going to be bored watching this. Exactly. So it's like, right, what can we do that's just stupid that, that so will entertain fun. us? So I love it. I love it. Every time a new video comes out, I'm just like, what have they come up to? Now, come up with now? It's, it's amazing. Um, but yeah, let's let's jump in and talk about this speaker. Um, we can see one just between the two of you here in this uh, Zoom shot, yep. and hopefully in the in the the full video recording, there's another one there on the side. Um, how did the, all this come about? When did you, when did, when was the decision made to build your own speaker? And maybe can you put that into the context of the whole Dolby Atmos world? Where are we at yeah. with that right now? Why does that force you to say, I'm going to build my own speaker? So it all, it all started because of, because of our interest in getting into Dolby Atmos. Um, and like, a lot of kind of good creative endeavors it came from lack of money right um so we were very skeptical about dolby atmos when it started when it sort of first started to get announced for for music purposes obviously it's been around in cinema for over a decade um and i've seen a lot of the surround formats come and go and they've all gone for music yeah um, and that's because people don't have surround systems properly set up in their living room exactly um, a lot of a lot of guys and girls in america do they have they've got bigger houses they've got room for sort of home cinema rooms and and stuff like that but they're generally not listening to music in it they're watching movies in it so i thought okay great here comes another surround format which is gonna die um let's just you know sit back and watch it disappear into the distance like all the others have and then I experienced it on various consumer devices that don't require speakers set up all the way mm -hmm. all the way around the room. One of which is a simple pair of headphones or or, or the Apple um, AirPods, which are are very good at replicating a binaural version of your your Atmos mix. And it was the point at which so I thought, okay, let's let's try it and and see how it goes. So we had various near field monitors in the studio that we'd had in for review so we we just cobbled together a really awful system where we had atc scm 200s at the front for left and right we had an adam uh t8v t8v in as a center uh we had some cali lp8s as sides and we had 
Fluid know. Audio FX80 was the other yeah, one. Yeah, Fluid Audio speakers at the back, a pair of focal budget near fields just strapped to the ceiling. Frank um, and Atmos. Literally. Yeah, it was awful. And you, you panned something around the room and it just it was like you were EQing a sort of filter sweep as it went round. It was it was just awful. But it gave us an idea of, of how the format worked. It wanted um, to live. And yeah. just hearing something in surround was a nice experience. Like Yeah, and it all happened from an artist I was working with and co producing an album with him. Um now he just sings, plays acoustic guitar and mandolin. So that's it in the track. There's his voice, an acoustic guitar and a mandolin. The most unlikely candidate for an atmos mix right you, you know ever really yeah uh, you don't want okay. the guitar spinning around your head no, you don't want thinking, the vocals it's like, how does that how does that move? yeah it's like it's like it's like how does that work um he lives on a houseboat uh-huh. and he'd got um a stove that heats the boat in the winter and there were two really cool sounding fans on the top of this stove that just throw the heat around the boat and he'd recorded each one on a on a track just on his phone that was intended for a song about the boat and where he lives and stuff like that and said can we put this into the mix so i said yep so we put the stove fans into the mix but we had to fade them out when the first verse came in because it was very distracting um then he added some bird song and then he added some bits of spoken word and then he added some backing vocals and then one of his and then friend, loads of percussion yeah loads of percussion then one of his friends came in and, and, and but this went on and we got 65 channels and I was having to EQ out the guitar, which sounded amazing, so as I could fit everything else in. And that was comp. And I thought, oh, yeah, what a, what a this waste. Would, yeah. This would be really good in Atmos. Yeah. So that's when we kind of fudged the system together. And I panned the stove fans at the back. I put the backing vocals all around. Um, there was a, a, a bit in the song where he actually sings, and the carousel goes round and round. Mm-hmm. I was like, well, that's got to go round and round, surely. So, so it did. Um, and we put the birds in the ceiling and we put the percussion wider to the sides and that meant and his vocal in the center channel and then the acoustic guitar in the left and the mandolin in the right and I didn't have to EQ anything at all and it sounded incredible and I thought okay this this is this has got legs this Mm -hmm. my skepticism went out the window but you're still going to need 12 16 speakers around the room to listen to it That was when Apple released the Dolby renderer as part of Logic. So I updated Logic and the advantage of that over the standalone Dolby renderer is that you can listen to the Dolby binaural mix on headphones just by a drop down menu. You can listen to the Apple spatial mix on headphones or you can switch back to your speakers. So I put a pair of headphones on and just switched to the binaural render just to see what it sounded like and immediately went oh whoops i forgot to turn the speakers off took the headphones off and no i had turned the speakers off and that was a what the moment put the headphones back on and was mind blown because when i'd first tried the binaural mix on headphones six months or so before it sounded like the stereo mix in a bin it it was just awful it didn't work at all but the algorithm had improved that much in that six months that it sounded like the speakers well for me it sounded like it was in a room it's you could hear depth you could almost hear some kind of you know roominess kind of echo kind of sound the 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 perception like it was in a space yeah the perception of space in it was incredible and the stuff i'd panned behind was behind it was i could hear and i'm i'd soloed the fans that i'd panned right in the rear channels and they were behind me in headphones Mm. And I know how that works because we've done binaural recordings before and it and it, it can be very, very convincing. Yeah. Um, but algorithmically, it's not as convincing as a proper binaural recording. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's but it's getting there. It's getting there really quickly. And with every OS update, that algorithm improves. And what what then really sold me on Atmos is that that binaural mix or that spatial mix or however you're listening to it, that is decoded in the playback device in real time. So as that technology improves, so the binaural mix improves. So you don't just upload a binaural mix to Apple Music or Tidal, and that's it, it always stays at that mix. As the technology and the algorithms improve, then so does the playback on whatever device you're you're listening onto. And even devices like an Amazon Echo Studio, a friend of mine has got one of those, and 
okay, it doesn't sound like a pair of ATCs in a room, but it's pretty good. And it knows where it is in the room. It knows how far it is from a wall or a reflective ceiling. And there's so many little super directional tweeters in, in, in these devices and soundbars now that they can fire sound up to the ceiling and reflect it off and then delay the direct sound so you really do get a, a sense that you're actually in a space from you know from one speaker it's it's crazy and at that point i was completely sold on atmos i was like right okay the i can envisage a situation which is happening now where a lot of consumers are listening to dolby atmos and they have absolutely no idea that they're listening to it and that's kind of where we are now now that apple have automatically got spatial audio enabled when you buy a new mm. device or, or yeah. update their operating system it's the consumer doesn't even know they don't need to go and buy anything um it's it's kind of already there on the technology that they've already got and that's what sold me on the on the format yeah it's interesting so the the, the real advantage that might make this uh, stay is the fact that it's it's it is basically 100 compatible with any system down the line or like simplifying it down to mono it will be yeah. all compatible and you're just as a creator as the as the as part of the production you're just creating one file if you will and it just yeah. falls down to the necessary playback system i guess down to mono if necessary and yeah it can go it can go down as low yeah as low as as mono but what really blew my mind was that when when everything was crashed down to stereo I still didn't need to, with the stereo mix, the original stereo mix, I needed to EQ an awful lot out of the guitar and the mandolin to get the other elements to come through. But when the Atmos mix was crashed down to stereo, I, I didn't need to do that. It just worked. Everything somehow had its own space. And I don't know how they've done that, but there's some very clever people work, working on the algorithms and the, and the kind of technology behind it. So it's um, actually making our lives easier to some extent as well. As, yeah. as yeah. producers, mixers, recordists, mixers, mastering engineers. Yeah, and then immediately after that, I came to realize that stereo is a really unnatural way to listen to anything. <laughs> um, so stereo kind of came about because we've got two ears, so two speakers yeah, anyway, make sense. It's also actually, very, it very vaguely defined. Like there is no one-to-one yeah. -one translation between this is how you record stereo, this is how you play back stereo. There is no such correlation. It doesn't exist. It's all no, just like exactly. more or less two speakers, somehow soundstage, somehow phantom center. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and now I'm like, well, stereo, I'm not interested in stereo anymore. That's, that's, I, I really seriously think this is as big as the transition from mono to stereo decades ago. Um, and I think we're very lucky to be alive right now at this kind of transitional period um and this is someone who was really skeptical i thought well, surround doesn't work for music who wants to hear a guitar behind you or a... but it's, it's not about that with with certain genres of music you can make stuff fly around the room and you can make stuff spiral up and fly around your head and if it's the appropriate genre it sounds incredible but some of the most enjoyable atmos mixes i've heard have been very natural recordings um of jazz quartets or some some of the orchestral recordings are spectacular because they just put a multi mic array above the conductor's head and then that plays back on all the speakers and you sit in the room and close your eyes and you're the conductor you can pick out individual instruments it's like well i can hear a viola that's two seats down from the other viola. It, it, and the sense of depth there's there's one recording i can't remember which one it was you can hear someone sweeping up in the background it's like the cleaning ladies come in and gone oh whoops they're recording and kind of scuttled off again and you but you can hear how far back in the room she is it's it's unbelievable um and that's how our ears work they work in in 360 degrees and all, all around our head so i think it's a very natural way to portray natural music and you can have a huge amount of fun with it on unnatural more processed music you can just if you want to kick drum in the ceiling you can do it yeah. you can just go bonkers and enjoy yourself and it's you know yeah. it's great it's good fun well i wonder how that's going to impact how we produce music potentially mm. right because obviously stereo impacted how we mix a lot and yeah. so um i wonder how that's going to change the entire production process kind of uh going backwards down the chain 
you know well a, prob- uh, a good example of that is probably me so me and one of my best mates jamie who worked here in the studio for a while started an album back in 2018 together and we still haven't finished it because there's 250 channels per song and there's like 100 million songs and you just can't fit all that crap into one stereo mix so what we're going to do is we're going to completely rearrange the songs for dolby atmos because we've now got loads more space to mix the stuff you know and we can be more dynamic with the way it's mixed we can we can add in parts of the arrangement that there would be no need for because you just can't fit them in stereo (coughs) excuse me you know and you can really like if you've got a string section coming in why not have them coming in behind you rather than just crowding where the guitars and stuff are yeah so we're going to basically start from the beginning and just redo everything because it just makes more sense and yeah. i mean we've been battling with those mixes for ages and i don't think we'll ever finish them in stereo yeah there's there's not enough room in two channels for your mix i've without, run out of speaker without compromising a lot of the channels <laughs> so, so yeah to get your separation so, yeah. yeah i'm i'm an, i'm an example of that we're literally going to start all again in surround because it makes life easier yeah. and i'm a very natural listening but i don't like the sound of compression and never mm-hmm. have um i like dynamics i like things to sound i listen to a lot of jazz and a lot of orchestral music and a lot of kind of real uh, musicians in a room and i like it to sound like the musicians in a room um and and it does and what another benefit of dolby atmos is the dynamic range it allows you because you have to upload your tracks to whichever service they're going on um at a maximum of minus 18 lufs mm-hmm which is crazy quiet. So and if you go space, above that, the the loudness police slap your wrist and it, does, it, it doesn't get accepted. It's, it's not a recommendation. It's a requirement. Interesting. And that allows you for enormous dynamic range. Yeah. Um, and now Apple are, if you have sound check enabled on your Apple device, they're turning all the super loud, super crushed stereo mixes down to the level of atmos so they suddenly sound really quiet and really tiny and really small and the atmos stuff sounds huge and open and 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 enormous um so that's great for me because i like the natural i I like to hear spikes in the audio i don't want everything Mm -hmm. chopped off at a certain certain threshold yeah Yeah. Uh, well maybe let's let's use that as a segue to look at the 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 flip side of the coin which is why the heck did that force you to build your own speaker yeah because <laughs> ultimately there must be still there still must be something wrong with this whole system if for if it's if it's a prohibitively expensive for you to say i'm going to just set this up using off the shelf equipment so yeah and maybe just throw in there um i heard you you say on the live stream yesterday that you basically can't play back a full atmos mix on your rig from apple music right now yeah which is just yeah. crazy so that means the core yes. system that is meant to decode the atmos mix <laughs> cannot be fed into your system yes well tell it me about can, that like but it's not so, so this is so this is the main problem so to to and 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 i'm not having a go at anyone because of this it's when mono went to stereo we had a switch on a mixing console that enabled us to switch between left center and right and that was it there was no pan pot uh, because that hadn't been invented yet they could work out how to electrically do that so you had sound and that's why a lot of early beatles records uh you hear the drums in the left channel and the bass in the right and the vocals split between the two so that comes out the middle um so we're kind of at that stage at the moment with atmos for music which means that a lot of companies need to do a lot of development work on a lot of technology pretty damn quickly because at the moment in order to be able to to get the sound from your computer into your speakers you need a load of unnecessary rubbish to be able to do that so the first thing you need is you need a audio interface with multiple outputs from your daw that's not actually easy if you want 16 channels if you've got 16 speakers that's not actually as easy as you think because there aren't many on the market and the ones that are tend to start at around the five thousand pounds or five thousand euro or dollar kind of kind of price point so just quickly what's the minimum what's the minimal channel minimum channel count for a dolby atmos well, it depends speakers. how many speakers you've got yeah dolby recommend so there's there's three numbers in the channel count there's a and dolby recommend a minimum for music of 
0.1.4. So that means seven speakers around the room. So you've got your left speaker, your right speaker, your center speaker, that's three. And then you've got two side channels, that's five. And then you've got two rear channels, that's your seven. Then you've got the one, which is a, a sub channel, mm-hmm. um, which can be more than one physical speaker but it's it's just one channel going to all those speakers that's specifically that's an lfe channel which stands for mm-hmm. low frequency effects a lot of people think it's low frequency extension it isn't it's effect so that's really purpose purposely purpose, designed for purpose sub speaker yeah yeah purpose so it's sub, not designed for putting the low end of your bass or your kick drum through it's designed for explosions and, and yeah, things yeah, like yeah. that uh, that's the one and then the four in 714 is four speakers above you in the ceiling um two at the front and two behind so as you can get a kind of sphere of audio happening around you so that's the minimum requirement for atmos for music for for, from dolby um so that's 12 channels minimum yeah so that's that's Mm -hmm. so that's yeah so that's 12 speakers around the room so you need an out you need an interface with at least 12 output channels once you've got that you then need a way to be able to turn the volume down Mm -hmm. um which some interfaces will do. So um, we've been using a Focusrite Claret 8 Pre-X. There's a setting there where the volume control can apply to all channels. So that's easy. You can turn mm-hmm. the volume down that way. If I was to expand the channel output count via ADAT or Speedif or any of the other digital formats on that interface, the volume control won't then control those. So then I'm turning the eight speakers I've got directly into the interface down, but I'm not turning the speakers down, that, so that's useless. So then you need yeah. a multi-channel monitor controller, and that's another five grand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, so that's your first problem. So you really need to spend between five and ten thousand pounds on an interface solution. Alone. And, mm-hmm. and however much on speakers. So it's a bit of a bill. Um, And then by the time you've done that, the first thing you want to do is listen to some commercial Atmos mixes on the speaker system you've just spent five figures on. And And you can't. You can't can't do that. (laughs) Well, you can do that. There's two ways you can do it. You can do it if you've got a Dante network, Uh because for some reason, Apple Music will speak to a Dante network and it will spit the channels out into the right format for atmos um and the second way you can do it is by adding a consumer decoder Mm -hmm. which will give you an hdmi input and various line level outputs for your for for your atmos configuration so then you need to buy an apple tv so as you can plug that into the hdmi input and listen to apple music or tidal or netflix or whatever on the apple tv but then, well, hang on a minute, I've got 16 speakers around the room and I've got 16 outputs from my interface plugged into those speakers. So to listen to that on the speakers, I need to repatch everything. So I've got the output of the consumer device going into the speakers or I need to add 16 inputs to the interface so as I can plumb that in and switch between them. So that's ridiculous. That that That's... That's so. That's three bucks, and then you still can't turn the volume down. So, so then you need some kind of monitor controller, or just do it in software, do it in the Dolby renderer, and turn the the slider down. But that's you know that can be dangerous because things crash, and uh, and and it doesn't always work. And then you suddenly find you've got 120 decibels of pink noise coming out from all around you, and you just panic and run out the room <laughs> and have to go and turn the power off at the consumer unit to get to go back into the studio again. So there's there's a lot of problems that need ironing out um, because so, they've so, been putting the sorry because the, yeah, because they've been putting the the research into the consumer end, which is fair enough because you know that's enough. yeah yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. again, and I'm also I'm not trying to kind of bl- bl- put any blame anywhere. It's a new technology; it needs to kind of yeah. find its way. But m- maybe to help out here for for p- potentially uh, manufacturers watching this, what w- and, and I know you guys like to you're quite good at kind of looking into the future and saying, look, this is what a system would look like if it would work well. That would work well. So maybe can you just like sketch out what the, a, a, a simple ideal solution might look like for a proper or for a proper Dolby Atmos setup for your average not super high end not starting off studio so you can actually yeah. do Al- Al- Dolby Atmos work and also reference Dolby Atmos mixes what would that look like 
it it's it, it would be a very very simple box so it would need to be a rack mount unit um or even a desktop type unit that's got 16 between 16 and 24 analog outputs on xlr or jack just analog balanced outputs uh no mic preamps no talk back no q mixes none of that no complicated routing software um a, a, a connection to the computer so usb or thunderbolt or one of the ethernet based um, avb or dante or, or something like that so a, a reliable connection to the computer a headphone socket so as you can check the binaural mix and crucially especially at the moment an hdmi input mm-hmm. um, and you can even use the hdmi input to connect to your DAW and mix using that because in most DAWs you can set your output devices whatever's plugged into the HDMI socket. Um, so and that, there and are that would be a lot of for some, for example Apple TV the Apple TV thing to yeah. stick, to stick in or yeah and other... then you can plug the yeah you can plug the Apple TV into that and then if you want to listen to what's new this week on Apple Music in Atmos you can you be have to hear it on your speaker system because at the moment if you haven't got that HDMI input or you haven't got the the Dante network, you only get 5.1 from Apple Music. So you get left, centre, right, and then everything else, it crashes down into not even the rear channels. It all comes out the side channels. So you lose a lot of the the depth and the spatial information from that because all the height channels and the rear channels are all crashed down into the sides, which is just... Really stupid. annoying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that's one of the frustrations at the moment okay. is that people come into the studio to hear the speakers and they're like, "Oh, can you play us an Atmos mix?" And we're like, "No, uh, no. no. I, I, yeah, I can play you some that I've done, but um, it, no, it's, yeah, yeah. Stick headphones on, listen to it on. <laughs> listen I guess to it on I that. guess it would need a volume knob as well. This box, right? A volume knob as well. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. so I guess that's kind of the minimum. So it's a, basically a a Dolby Atmos interface that can also interface some commercial solution to kind of route through yeah. the same system with a volume knob. Yeah, and right. then you've got, so so the, the, the consumer decoder, the audio interface, the headphone solution, and the volume knob all in one That's box. That's the minimum box. And bring it in for 1,500 quid. Yeah. It's going to happen. The, um, it's just a matter of time, I'm sure. It, it is going to happen. Well, we've, we've been on some Zoom calls with a few audio interface manufacturers. There you go. Mm-hmm. And things are happening, things are on the way, but the the reluctance with all of them is the HDMI socket. Um, and it's because there's there's licensing fees uh. to be paid for HDMI and and stuff like that. But it's it's like fifteen cents a unit. It's not a lot. Or something ridiculous. So it's and if you put the HDMI logo on the front, then that comes down to five cents. So, you know, to make a thousand units, that's fifty dollars. That's yeah. <laughs> that's not a huge but I know costs add up but um just put an hdmi socket on it manufacturers please yeah i'm sure they'll figure it out Um, yeah and i'm sure i'm sure eventually apple music will work on any multi-channel audio interface um that's got to happen and i've i've been i've been in talks i've been obviously going backwards and forwards with dolby to make sure we get this room as good as it can be and i keep putting pressure on them to keep putting pressure on apple to you know sort this out for the the home producer you've included it as part of logic so let us be able to listen to it on the speakers we've bought it's a it's a simple thing really and um i'd, I'd actually really want to just talk about that for a second uh although we've got 20 minutes we've gone 20 minutes i'd love to obviously talk about the speaker but uh maybe just to round this discussion off what uh, how compatible is this with like your home typical home studio like your kind of four by three meter spare bedroom prof- audio professional how how would they implement a dolby atmos system i think it's still possible i mean so we, yeah. we there's a yeah. gent that lives near to us that's got a system with neumann mains he's got jbls in the ceiling and what did he have in the rears i think it was more neumann's wasn't it yeah the little neumann kh80 yeah around it the room. works i mean his room is literally i think three by four meters it's a tiny little room with a two and a half meter ceiling um it does work you know obviously it's not a a big system so you're not going to be pushing out 130 db all around the room Mm -hmm. but you don't need to um like the dolby spec is 85 db as long as you're getting that out of your speakers fine and that's you know pretty much any any speaker these days apart from maybe the tiniest of the tiniest yeah exactly um Mm. 
and you can do it on headphones. Yeah. Yeah. And my advice to people wanting to get into <coughs> Dolby Atmos would be start on headphones and see how you get on because already it's really good, but it's it's just it's that's getting better all the time. But then that's when a dedicated mastering stage comes in. So so the 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 reference mix for Dolby. So so the music gets sent to the the streaming services as an ADM file, which is basically a huge file that contains all of the multi-channel audio and metadata that tells the playback device where to put it. So that's the file you upload, and that has to be done on speakers. And the reason it has to be done on speakers is because that's kind of the gold reference standard, because the because the playback is decoded in real time on the device and that's constantly evolving and improving, then a binaural mix that you do today will sound very different in six months' time and hopefully a lot better. So that that's constantly evolving. So you can't just do it on headphones without a certain amount of guesswork and kind of praying that it'll sound as you intended it in the future. Where on speakers you can because um, that, that you know, you've got your Dolby sort of specified setup and that's that's kind of the gold standard so that's so that's where i come in um as a mastering engineer um and then that was the big problem for me that inspired the speakers it was like okay i'm used to atc main monitors and i've been to lots of rooms in london to hear their atmos systems where they've got atc or the equivalent of they've got very expensive monitors in the in in the front of the room as left and right and very cheap monitors around the room because there's you know there's a bill attached to it money yeah. money money yeah. exactly. <laughs> exactly but then what happens is if you do for some reason want to put your kick drum in the ceiling it sounds awful because yeah. you've got a tiny little speaker in the ceiling that's not capable of reproducing the low end of the kick drum so i thought and and, and for mixing i think that's fine you can kind of know how it's going to sound especially when you you know when you've been working in it for a while and you're referencing in other rooms and you can sort of average it out and do that but if 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 I'm mastering an Atmos record I need to know that whatever's going around that wh whatever goes out into the room and comes out from the front needs to sound as good as it does when it's in the front it's got to it's got to sound the same all the way around the room and that's what dolby say they say i did in the perfect atmos system you want the same speaker all the way around the room for for every channel so that was my goal but i'm used to high-end monitors and have been for years and years and years so all the rooms we went to in london i was like nope not good we went to the pmc room i was like nope not good enough the neumann system nope not good enough um and various other systems like nope not good yeah stereo sounds great surround sounds rubbish and and I want to be able to flip a mix. So listen to a stereo mix the right way around in the room and then flip that mix round so as I can turn round and listen to it in the two <laughs> rear speakers. And if that sounds rubbish, then it's rubbish. It's, it's not good enough. So that was the problem. Um, so it's like, right, okay, that, so that's my goal. I want to be able to turn around 180 degrees and have the same sound coming out of my two rear speakers as I've got coming out the left and right. Interesting. And okay. that's going to be really expensive. And that's yeah. when I cried a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then we, so, and we approached various companies. Um, I spoke to Ben at ATC, who's ever helpful. They're just a fantastic company who I have nothing but respect for because they do a home cinema. It's called the HTS system, the home theater system, mm -hmm. which is, and they do a three way. So with their classic mid range driver, in a cabinet that I think is only four inches deep and is designed to go on the wall. And he said, I would not recommend that for professional use. Huh. It's not good enough. So I thought, like, okay. Um, and that would have been, you know, that would have been about 40,000 pounds yeah. for that. I was, right. So we added it up and it was the cheapest system we could have done with ATC would have been about 125,000. Um, but for what we actually wanted, which which would have been probably SEM 100s all around the room with maybe SEM 45s in the ceiling would have been about £250,000 for the full system. And that's exactly five times what my first house cost. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it's like, right, okay, that's not, that's, that's just not, not going to happen. Yeah. So we, we put it on hold for a few months, but I, but then labels started approaching me and saying, can you, can you master in Atmos? And I'm like, no, um, but I'd recommend 
a, you know, a colleague or a, a friend in London who I know is working in Atmos in one of the, uh, uh, Abbey Road or or wherever, and say no, but I recommend you know this guy to to do it. So they go, oh, thanks very much. So they'd scurry off with the Atmos mix, and then I'd find that that engineer was then doing the stereo record as well. So then I wasn't getting any work from <laughs> from you know this label that I've built a fifteen year relationship with was suddenly also taking the stereo master to them to be done at the same time and i was like right okay i need i need to do this now mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. because labels are asking for it um as a marketing tool as much as a sonic tool if you release your music on apple music in spatial audio or dolby atmos you're going to get high up the you're going to you're going to get you've got much more chance of getting on that home page than just regular stereo so i decided i had to do it and then we decided to well, let's, it's just drivers in a box, isn't it? So let's, <laughs> with an amp. So let's build our own speakers. Hooray. And, and then we did, how difficult yeah. it was. So had, it, any of it. You two, had any of you two actually built a speaker before? Yes, I had um, years and years ago, and it was awful. Uh huh. Uh, and I didn't, I, yeah, I didn't, I read a few books, but I didn't know enough about it to know why it was awful. And I didn't understand. The importance of how a cabinet works hand in hand with a bass driver to form a cohesive system um i just didn't know that then so i sort of messed around a bit um and when i when i started in recording when my sort of studio career started you couldn't buy a studio monitor mm -hmm. as a product from a shop they didn't exist um, you could buy a hi-fi speaker, which is why you saw lots of NS10s in, in studios, but you couldn't go and buy a studio monitor because the studio monitors were designed for the studios they were in. So you'd go to Abbey Road and they would have a Quested system or a, or a, or a, a, you know, a BMW system, um, and then you'd never go into another studio and find the same pair of speakers in the room because all the speakers were built by companies like Quested and ATC and, and PMC. They were specifically built for those studios. So that's what I tried to do when I built my first studio because I didn't have any other option. Uh, and, it, yeah, it was just awful. It just sounded terrible. Um, it was like a car speaker, but standing outside the car with the car with the door shut, it was just like, well, that's that's no good. Uh, so I went so, back to hi-fi speakers, as a lot what, of people did at the time. To then decide to build your own, and I mean, what one of the things that boggled my mind so much is like I know how all the um, variables interact so tightly when you're building a speaker, right? And that's in, in many ways what makes it so difficult and why experience matters so much. Yeah. Um, and I'd really like to for, for you to talk talk to me about um, how that process of checking, f deciding on the different components worked when it's also interconnected, right? So you started with, I believe you picked the amp first. Was that correct? Yeah. That correct. Yeah. Sort of. You picked yeah. the amp correct first, and then you you went you went to the drivers, picking like two by basically trying out all these different options. How do you choose a good driver combination when you haven't decided or when you haven't built a proper cabinet yet that makes the driver work? That's the difficult bit. So the reason why we started with the amplifier, because I because because I knew I'd learned a lot since then, and I was lucky enough to be having help with this project from some people that are very good at speaker design. Um, who I'd love to be doing videos with, but they can't because they work for other speaker manufacturers <laughs> and just r really wanted to help us out. Um, but So we've had lots of help. I need to say that first off. I've had lots of help and I've learned a huge amount of stuff from, from a lot of people. Mm -hmm. one, one, one person who's been a huge inspiration and an enormous a lot, lot of help is Jez Kerr, who I can mention because he runs Kerr Acoustic up in Cambridge and we've done a lot of collaboration with him. I was I had a pair of his speakers here for six months and was mastering on them and they're incredible. Um, but again, they were just kind of out of our price range. But he's been a huge help and hugely supportive. Um, and so big thank you to him and the other people that have helped as well. But because the particularly the bass driver you pick is so dependent on the cabinet, it's in, I thought that would be a silly place. To, I thought that, that that's kind of the end point. So I just took the chain right back to the beginning. I thought, right, okay, I've got an XLR with some audio coming out of it. What am I going to plug that into? Am I going to go for a 
single channel amplifier with a passive crossover in the speaker? Am I going to go for an active crossover and then an amplifier for each driver? Or am I going to go for a DSP solution for the crossover and then a, an active amplifier for each driver? Um, so I, I experimented with various. I knew we didn't want to go passive because we'd need to be able to tweak things for the room, and that's very difficult to do with a passive crossover. You've got to change components out and it takes forever. And by the time you've done that, you've forgotten what you were listening for in the first place. So we knew it needed exactly, to be yeah. either an active crossover or a DSP solution. Um, and we went with DSP in the end. And I was very, and, and class D amplification. And I was very skeptical of that because I've had bad experience with class D amplifiers. They just, for a long time, they didn't sound very good. Uh, but now they do. Now they sound incredible and they're super low distortion. And as long as you get a good, a good amplifier so the choice for that became hypex um for various reasons that was what was recommended to me by a lot of people um i know a lot of the products that bruno putzies who started hypex and developed the new breed of class d amplifiers was very heavily involved with philips and the whole kind of engineer and development of class d and i trust everything that he does the guy's a genius um, and i knew he was responsible for the hypex amps so we bought a pair and we tried them and they were it was like there wasn't anything there they were taking a quiet signal and making it louder and that was it there was no distortion there was no coloration there was they were just making stuff louder can you can like, you just right. just just to, to to clarify when you say you tried it what does that mean did you literally just plug the driver into the into the the amplifier and played some music and just listened uh, paint me a picture of yeah, so, what does that so, look like in practice Yeah, so we tried it with our. So we've got a pair of Quested monitors from the from the eighties. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, they were the first or the second pair of monitors that Roger Quested ever built. Um, that came out of a very famous studio in Oxford Street in London, which is long gone now. Uh, but we ended up with those speakers somehow through various connections in the industry and, and i've mastered on those for for many years um so that was so it was like okay we've got a speaker that we can use to test the amplification so that was gotcha. kind of a a tried and trusted and known quantity we could okay. we knew mm -hmm. that we could gauge the quality of the amplification because we'd been so used to to listening to those um And we and we tried lots of different things, and the, and the Hypex won, the Class D won, didn't it? It did, and the conversion on the Hypex amps as well is literally second to none. So on our particular amps that we've got, which is the FA253, there's an analog input and an AES input. And we tried blind testing, both between ourselves and a few other people, and you cannot tell which is which. The conversion is... Yeah, it's you know, totally it, transparent. It's transparent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that won for us as well, because that almost kind of removed it didn't physically but it sounded like it removed a stage of conversion from the process there was nothing breaking when it went into the amps it was just yeah. clean in and out and that's when we decided to go for the dsp front end because again dsp didn't sound very good for the longest time um but i've 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 always said that in uh, and it's why the youtube channel is called present day production is because we're trying to bring a lot of production stuff into the present rather than having it, you know, oh, you've got to have racks of 1176s and stuff like that. It, it's That's fine. But um, I always sort of advocate that we need to look to what live world, what live sound engineers are doing and bring some of that technology into the studio with digital desks and um, wall boxes connected between rooms using ethernet instead of copper um and and we we need to be inspired by them because you go to a gig these days and generally it sounds incredible compared to how it did 10 15 20 years ago um it's like listening to an enormous hi-fi um and they're using class d and they're using dsp and they're using all the technology to their advantage and that's something that studio people are very reluctant to do for some reason so i was kind of skeptical of dsp and class d for, for for a very long time but now it's it's that good it's it's just it's the best option i think for for us i agree i mean i spent some time learning sound sound system design and uh studied with merlin van veen uh, did some seminars with him um and he or but basically what i learned was at the time that sound system design and that whole world was just a decade ahead of studio technology yeah. it was crazy what they do with speakers 
we're not even we're not even fantasizing about yet you know no exactly and yeah. it's uh it's crazy so um so that totally makes sense to me um let's that, so so the so the ampli it was the decision, decision was made on the amplifier you tested that with the quested now the quested is out and yep. in come the new drivers yeah how do you decide how do you listen how did you test the drivers can you show, can you talk to me about the the actual test setup to listen to these drivers and yeah, make that decision. So, so again, that's a difficult process and I wasn't sure how to go about it. So I decided that the, we, we definitely wanted a three-way design. Um, I've never found a two-way speaker that I would be comfortable mastering on. Uh, there are two-way speakers that you can master on. I'm not saying there aren't. It's just that I can't, I've never, one of the best I've encountered is the PSI A17. M, which is a fantastic two-way speaker, but it, again, it was just missing that critical mid-range detail. And our ears are super sensitive in the mid-range. The first thing you hear when you're born is the sound of a human voice, and that's one of the most important sounds we need to hear throughout our lives. So our ears are tuned to the mid-range. So I, I generally always want a dedicated mid-range driver. Worked on ATC three-way systems for years. Our Quested speakers had the ATC mid-driver in them, so that was a that was a kind of good. Test the benchmark. Rig for the yeah. yeah yeah good benchmark for the amps so i knew we wanted three-way so i thought well the 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 and i like a dome tweeter and i like a dome mid-range we considered ribbons uh we considered amt tweeters as well but ribbons are very uh they give a very wide dispersion um but not a very good vertical dispersion and for atmos you want 360 degree dispersion so a dome mid-range and a dome tweeter made perfect sense um spoke to a lot of other people including jez and said you know what 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 do we want for atmos and he said well, you want domes because they're three you've got a 360 degree dispersion mm -hmm. and you want yeah. you, you know you've got up to 50 phantom centers <laughs> going on so so dome so look right okay so we want a dome tweeter we want a dome mid-range and they're going to be sealed units, so they don't technically even need a cabinet. Interesting. So yeah. I thought, let's start with the tweeter and work that. So we'll start with the tweeter and then go to the mid-range and then we'll tackle the base end once we've done that because the mid and the uh, the high are relatively easy because they're not fussed about what cabinet they're in. Um, and that's when we went through lots of different tweeters, lots of different mid-range drivers. An obvious choice was something very similar to the ATC. Now you can't buy drivers from ATC anymore. They won't sell you drivers. They'll only sell you a complete system. Whereas 10 years ago, you could buy a mid driver okay. and, a, and a base driver. So ATC drivers were out. There's a company in the UK called Vault who make a very similar mid range to the ATC. Uh, so that was, and Jez uses those in the Kerr Acoustic three way as well. And they sound fantastic. So that seemed to be an obvious choice for the mid range. Uh, the problem being there was a six to nine month lead time uh, on a on a pair, so it's like that's no fun. That's no fun. Uh, so we, <laughs> so I, I, so we kind of thought we still really want to go with that, but sort of put it on hold um, and looked for other options. And then that's when I found this tweeter. So someone made me aware of. This, which is the Bleesma T25S6, it's a 25mm soft dome. Um, so I ordered a pair of those just to try with the with the Quested's, um, and it was incredible, hmm. wasn't it? It's okay, like, so, okay. But so here's the first question already. So you said you tried it with the Quested. Does that mean you literally just replaced the tweeter and just let? Yeah. And then, but then did you mess with the amp in order to do the integration properly, to do the crossovers properly? So how or yeah, did you so, just leave it as is and just say fuck it if there's a if there's a massive <laughs> uh, cancellation at the crossover point because they're all messed up I don't care how did you deal with that Yeah so the so the test rig looked like um we so we knew we wanted to go for a DSP front end but that wasn't practical for my testing because I needed to be able to turn knobs and turn the volume if, if the volume of that's got to go down 3 db i need to be able to do it like that exactly, by turning yeah. a knob not by finding the laptop loading the software plugging it into the thing uploading and, and, it to and, the and, dsp and, waiting for yeah it to exactly and yeah. and all that so so i had a i just had a really cheap dbx active line level crossover ah, plugged in 
Okay, yeah. which was analog with knobs on the front, and that gave me three channels. I could change the crossover points at the turn of a knob, and I could change the gain at the turn of a knob. So I assembled a Frankenstein Hypex amplifier rig um, in a really shoddy box, just 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 with line inputs and a speaker output for for testing, and just used this DBX crossover, which actually did a great job. It mm. sounded amazing, and and when when we arrived on the on the final design i gave that to james and said right make the dsp sound like that do this and, and, and that was kind of his starting point so that meant i could try the i could unplug the tweeter that was in the quested and i could just this, this was just on top with a single screw in in the front just holding it and a couple of cables in the back um just to evaluate the tweeter and, and, and you had I, it set up here love... in this room or where did you set up yeah yeah that was in this room yeah because i know just the room one speaker again or did you do two so you could check? no i did two yeah, yeah i did everything as a pair because it's very difficult to to be able to evaluate obviously you can't evaluate stereo image or anything like that with just the one so yeah. um, i made sure we did everything as a as a pair um so that proved its worth straight away so i was like right okay we've found our tweeter great and we tried lots of others it, we didn't go straight to that we tried scan speak we, we tried a whole host of vifa um there's we i took a lot of tweeters out of monitors we've got around the studio that are available as oem parts and tried those as well um and none of them came close to that that was that was magic and really neutral as well it wasn't colored it wasn't hyped it wasn't harsh it was it was just a great sounding tweeter so i was like right okay thanks for the recommendation everyone yeah great tweeter um when stanislav from blisma sent me the data sheets for the t25 tweeter he also sent me some data sheets for a product that they hadn't officially released yet which is that which is basically a bigger version of that um and that is a three inch or 75 mil mid dome um silk domed mid-range unit which is exactly what I was looking for for our design. So I was like, ah, oh, they do a mid-range. Give me, so, give me, yeah. take my money, take my money. Yeah, exactly. So James was pouring water over me. Um, <laughs> and I, so I emailed Stanislav and said, send me a pair of these immediately. Um, and, he, and he did. Um, he'd just made the first batch. Um, we well, can see how new they are because the serial number on that is 119. So they'd oh, only made nice. 100 before that. Yeah. That's going to go to a museum yeah. someday. And this is this is the second batch. This is one of the yeah. later. The, yeah, the first, it was in the low tens. I think the wow. first one you sent. Well, I think we were the first people in the country to get that. Yeah, um, and it was nice. so. So there weren't any, and there were lots of reviews online of these because these have been out eighteen months or so, and all the reviews were great. From Audio Science Review, had done some great reviews of them, and various other other websites, magazines, things like that. They were gaining traction in car audio as well. A lot of car audio guys were picking up on these as a fantastic tweeter to put in your pillar either mm -hmm. side of your windscreen um so i was very excited to get the the, the mid driver from him um and the, the you know the specs on paper were fantastic um and then it it they turned up and i was like oh that's you compare it with the atc or the vault this is i think about 225 grams the atc and the vault are nine kilograms so this is 40 times lighter than than an ATC mid driver. So my immediate thought was it's not going to be good ever. enough. Never. Yeah. Yeah, no way. Forgetting that technology has moved on um including rare earth magnet technology uh, of which there's a lot in in this. Um so I sort of cast my dispersions aside and said well let's let's try it. Mm. I'd built a monitor by this time um based on the, the the technical parameters for this and we would we'd, by this time i'd started to experiment with base drivers so i was trying different base drivers um and that's the that's the bit that took the time because you have to try a base driver in a cabinet and you have to design and build the cabinet specifically for the base driver and if it doesn't work then you have to do it again so each iteration of the low end requires you to build a cabinet which is a complete pain in the ass, especially when your woodworking is accomplished amateur, which is how I'd describe um, myself. Okay. Another so, thing as well, because... So, so tell me what, what, what definitely doesn't work for a speaker cabinet. What have you discovered that definitely does not work? 
Good question. So if the cabinet, it, lots of things, uh-huh. <laughs> lots, everything. Uh, so what doesn't work? Um, the first one is cabinet volume. Mm-hmm. So, so the first thing you have to do is is decide when you, well, before you build a cabinet, you have to decide what loading principle you want to go with. So that means on a base driver, sound comes out the front and sound comes out the back. With this, it doesn't. With this, sound comes out the front, and with the tweeter, sound comes out the front. So that's easy. That doesn't even need a cabinet. With the bass driver, the sound comes out the front, but a, an equal amount of sound comes off of the cone at the back, and that's out of phase with what's at the front. So if you play a 100 hertz test tone through a bass driver in free air, you don't hear anything. You see it move, but you don't hear anything because it's it's cancelling out. So you have to decide what you're going to do with the rear energy coming from the back of the driver. And really, you've got you've got two options. You either try and get rid of it, or you use it to your advantage and you uh, use it in a Somehow ported system. Somehow push it in the room a, in the right way. Yeah, 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 exactly. So the advantage of getting rid of it is that you got rid of it. Mm-hmm. You don't have to worry about it. Um, but your but efficiency then you get, just plummets. It does, yeah, because you're only hearing what's coming off the off the front of the of the cone. Um, the so the advantage of using it to your advantage is greater SPL. The disadvantage of using it to your advantage is that it has to go through a process before it comes out and reaches your ears. You have to so immediately you've got the phase problem. What's coming off the back of the driver is out of phase. So it has to either go through some sort of labyrinth to put it in phase, like it does in a transmission line. Or you have to use that energy in some kind of tuned system, like a ported enclosure, where basically you've got a Helmholtz resonator at the front that's resonating at a certain frequency that's being generated by the energy coming off the back of the driver. And the problem with that is you've got a fairly narrow queue because you've got to tune the port and you've got to tune the enclosure. And then you can end up with a very lumpy low end or a very boomy low end. Um, and that takes time, and, and there are very good designs out there that don't exhibit that. Again, ATC being an example, head being an example. You can't hear the, what the port's doing when you listen to a pair of head monitors. Um, PSI, again, you can't hear the port. Um, you put your hand in front of it, you can feel the air coming in and out, but by the time you get back a metre or so, you don't feel that anymore because it's just a really well-designed system. And it's an experience um, thing, that, right? Which I guess you couldn't yeah. sidestep altogether. I could, you could have put the time in, but ultimately it was a, uh, probably a practical decision to just say, screw all this, we're going with a closed cabinet. Yeah, uh, so I experimented with a lot of ported enclosures because one of the problems, and the sealed, the sealed enclosures in parallel, so there were lots of speaker cabinets all around the building, which, which there still are in various states of disrepair, uh, some covered in blood. But, but So I experimented with, so we ruled out a transmission line because we wanted a very shallow cabinet that could go on a wall and not, so I'm not going to just walk, bang my head on the corner every time I'm walking around the room. So we wanted a shallow design. So that ruled out a transmission line design even though it's technically possible and pmc do a very good job of it that's the kind of thing that would have needed to have put 18 months or two years and several tens of thousands into development so it's like right okay that's out the question um so it's got to be ported or a sealed enclosure um and i got the port right and the enclosure right once Hmm. and we had a seven inch six and a half inch seven inch driver in a ported enclosure uh, that was revision three of the cabinet. I'd got it wrong three times, but when I got it right, it sounded incredible. And you couldn't hear the port. You couldn't feel anything coming out of the port at a a few inches away from the the cabinet. I was like, oh, this is great. And I said to you, come in and have a listen. And then immediately we invited lots of people we know and trust in to listen to the speakers um and i and by this time these were were in the box so this was kind of the first revision of a of, of the the finished thing and so just almost. just to to have a picture in my mind this is basically you building a cabinet putting the base driver in it putting the yep. the mid and the tweeter in it and then bodging together some sort of crossover thing with your dbx uh yeah. controller and so that was kind of the yeah. setup where you just like you put it all together physically in the box then you kind of put it up here in the room with you and you like you 
played some music, you started messing around with the, the crossover and the volume until you were just like, oh, okay, there we go. And yeah. now let's listen sort of thing. Is that right? Yeah. And yeah, now let's listen. So, so the port was actually built as part of the cabinet, part of the enclosure. So it, was, it wasn't a, a tube you know, in a right. hole. It was actually, I'd actually built it as part of the cabinet. Um, and there are, there are advantages and disadvantages. I mean, the most efficient surface area shape for a port is a circle so really a tube in a hole is probably the best bet and i should have done that because then instead of having to make new cabinets each time i could have just sawn a bit off the pipe but hindsight eh? so, so there we go so another um, way not to build a cabinet yeah yeah exactly so mm -hmm. that was the first time at which we invited people in to listen to just get some feedback on it because i was pretty tired of listening to all these different versions of, of what we'd come up with um by now to to skip back a step before that stage i'd evaluated it so i was so when so when these turned up we'd got our first revision of the base cabinet um with a hole cut out ready for this so we very very excitedly put these in um the day they turned up and everything sounded awful mm. Um, and everything sounded awful because I'd got the low end wrong and because I'd got the low end wrong that was clouding what I was hearing in the mid range and the highs because it's all, and all of a sudden the, the tweeter didn't sound very good anymore and it and at, th at that point I was like oh, I'm not a speaker designer I can't do this um, Rough. and then mm -hmm. slept on it overnight and then the next morning I was like no it's because the low end's wrong um, so at that point I went back to the quested speakers and disconnected the mid and the tweeter and i built a little box that just had these two drivers in it that i could try with different pre-existing base options at which point these started to sound absolutely spectacular and i was completely Amazing. sold on this as being honestly the best mid driver i have ever heard um, and stanislav makes a beryllium domed version which is even better so we've got to get a pair of those to, to test those out but um mm -hmm. this is spectacular that's spectacular and they're brother and sister so they work really well together they you can't tell where that that ends and this takes over they just work together really well as a as a cohesive system so that that got our mid and and high sorted um but then it was the low end so that so then that's when we came up with the ported enclosure for the seven inch driver um and that was the point at which i'd got the crossover points right so the crossover points sounded sounded best uh which again the technical specifications of the drivers would disagree with that this this is crossed over from the base driver at 400 hertz and it should be crossed over higher mm -hmm. because that's not really designed to go down to 400 hertz we should be up at 1k or so but it just sounded better crossed over at 400 hertz it sounded a lot more natural um the bass was putting out a lot less mid information and this was going down a little bit lower um and it just sounded better so so that's where we disbanded the measurements and i said to james right there's the there's the hypex filter design software want to cross over at 400 hertz and 3.5 kilohertz want it to sound like what's coming out of this ancient dbx pa <laughs> thing knock yourself out at which point you did mm. um yeah exactly so, so this is this is james where you come in with the, the yes. crossovers right actually making those happen um yeah and so talk, 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 talk to is, me about that yeah so obviously crossover design is something that neither of us have ever done especially in dsp world we've never you know had any reason to before now so it was a steep learning curve and Mark left that to me because anytime he walks into a room with a computer, the computer catches fire or if it, if it's a explodes Windows, or whatever. If it's a Windows PC, I emit some kind of destructive electromagnetic force. He does. That just means it just doesn't work. Like there, I was editing a video the other day, absolutely fine, not a problem. All day I was working on my own next door, and Mark comes in and the computer crashes. I like, had how? a problem like that once. How does that happen? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, I spent a long time. I, I read the entire hundred-page manual about a hundred times. Um, going through the filter software to try and learn how to do it um, and just spent a load of time messing around with different settings to see what worked and was referencing because I've now got our ATC SCM 200s next door um, with our system in there so I was A, B in quite a bit between that and the Bleesma mid and high um, to see what the best comparison was and then kind of finding a good level ground between what the ATC was getting right and what it was missing and what I thought sounded good 
and bad. And then also referencing it with our Trinov as well to see how that kind of measured on a flat spectrum. Um, and yeah, it was, a, it was a steep learning curve, but I actually really enjoyed it. Um, there was very little that was done to the actual crossovers in the end. Um, the base end, there's no processing whatsoever. It's just a high pass at uh, 50 hertz on these ones because the subs cross over a little higher. Um, and a low pass at... 400, 400 and that's it there's no kind of notches or anything like that the mid again very simple there's just one notch i think at about 500 to just bring out a little bit of that area that was lacking and then the treble comparatively slightly more but even so i think it was about three notches just to take out a few harsh frequencies there was one at three and a half k that we don't particularly like either of us so i got rid of that bit of sparkle at 10k and that was it really it yeah. at first i was doing a lot more than i needed to which was lack of experience. Um, so we found that the more changes you make, the more kind of phase distortion it creates, um, which kind of mm -hmm. makes sense. So I stopped, I deleted the whole lot and started again, trying to do as little as possible, but obviously st still trying to get it sounding good. Um, and in the end, yeah, it was very simple. I mean, the treble end has got about three notches in the end. Um, very little done elsewhere. Just lots of tuning and we also, testing we also had the um lazy idea of so this is lazy engineering at its peak of using the trinov to because one one thing that the trinov will do is it will act as an active crossover mm -hmm. if you want it to so before it does any of its optimization and its room correction and all the wonderful stuff it does you can use it as part of an active speaker system and it will design its own crossover mm -hmm. so you tell it the impedance of the drivers connected are at roughly what frequency points you want it to cross over. It will then listen to it will play a, a tones out of each driver, and then not only will it fine tune the crossover point um, and a suitable kind of EQ curve for the crossover, but it will tell you what time delay it has applied to the drivers to get the drivers in in phase alignment. So we thought, well, that will be brilliant. And then if the Trinov says that the what it's hearing from the tweeter it's hearing slightly before what it's hearing from the mid-range then we can calculate the delay that the trinov is as as given in terms of physical distance and then we can offset the tweeter to Clever. compensate and then we'll have a perfectly phase aligned system so that without was without actually needing the dsp yeah 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 interesting yeah okay. and then and then we get and then we our ethos is get it right at source so the the, the more we can get right earlier on if there's no point in, i mean you could just chuck three random drivers in a box and then let the trinov sort it out um but you're not going to get the best results out and the same and, and you know the, the trinov won't compensate for no acoustic treatment uh so you need to go so the, one of the really good things you can do with the trinov is you can learn from it and then go back and fix problems as early on as you can Very and clever. then it just gives you even it gives you even better results after that um but it turned out that because these are so good and they're designed to work, work with each other mm -hmm. that absolutely the best place to place them is it's just right flush. on top of yeah like that so, so i was gonna say having said that all about the trin off cross everything we ended up not using any of that information in the end the only thing that we're using is kind of the the spectral response um to measure the the kind of amplitude across the the spectrum um but the actual crossover stuff we ended up ditching and i did it manually interesting um because yeah, it ended it, up sounding better because the, the the main problem with crossovers right is if you don't get a phase match at the crossover frequency you actually get cancellation yeah. at that frequency yes right yeah and so that's yeah. what the and the 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 only technical way to do that right is to actually measure the phase response of each driver individually and then mm. do the delay settings in a way that they then match at the crossover frequency yeah, so that's what sound yeah. system designers do when they do when they align big PA systems, and yeah. so Trinov, I guess, does this for you, which is the brilliant part. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because as as far as I understand, you you didn't actually do any complicated measurements apart from using Trinov, and then g getting somebody in with Smart at some point. Yes, which I'd like you so... to talk about in a second as well. Okay. But um, so that means uh, I'm not surprised that the mid driver and the tweeter are actually phase the line at the crossover because they're built by the same person and that the fact that 
they uh, they align when you actually align them physically just means yeah. that they did the right this person did the, did their job correctly basically yeah um, but with a different base driver there's no no nobody that says nothing that says oh these are just going to match in terms of no. phase so how did you deal with that did is there a delay setting on the base driver or on the tweeter mid system how are those matched there were some things done within the hypex dsp along those lines however i i must admit i don't know how i've done it but there, <laughs> um there has there is now a completely flat phase response across the entire spectrum on our system um to within a couple of degrees apart from something which is room based in here which we need to fix which is there's a phase wrap around at 140 hertz um, but we've we've worked out that's the room that's the problem, not the speakers. Um, so yeah, huh. through lots of tweaking and googling and experimenting, we've actually managed to get the phase completely flat in the amp itself. So now the Trinov is doing very little, um, especially on the the kind of amplitude side of things. It if you bypass the Trinov, it sounds roughly the same. Mm -hmm. The only thing that changed is the kind of stereo imaging gets ever so slightly enhanced due to its kind of frequency based phase alignment that it does on the Trinov, which I can't do on the Hypex amps. That's per driver, not per frequency. So it's it's only mm -hmm. a three way phase alignment. Yeah. Um and it sorts out the lumps and bumps of the low end in the room. Yes. As well. So the after curve on the Trinov is is well it's not ruler flat because we've tweaked it to suit our own target curve, what we like to work with and listen to. But if you don't do that, it's pretty much Within, it's within about a decibel it's within about a db from about 25 30 hertz all the way to, up up to 20k um but we were but we did use the 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 trinov was invaluable and paid for oh, yeah. it, paid for itself as a measurement tool particularly with phase not so much with amplitude and, and eq but mm -hmm. with with phase response to the point that when doug from next door came in with his smart rig so he's a he's a pa engineer he's been working in PA system building systems for for decades knows everything there is to know about speaker design way more than I ever will. He came in, um, looked at the calculations or looked at the measurements from the Trinov and said, "Okay, let me do that with my smart rig and see if they match." They pretty much did. Smart gave us the came the same kind of results as as Trinov did. Um, yeah, there's a wrap around at 140 hertz, um, but he so he's looking at the measurements and listening to the system and couldn't tell where we'd where the crossover points were mm -hmm. and took a guess and was completely wrong yeah he guessed a, about 150 hertz and 6k so this is between the tweeter the mid and the mid and the base and try to get the base yep. yeah okay yeah mm -hmm. so, well, so it he, just, it so just he shows guessed. that the alignment is correct i mean if if yes. you do that correctly yeah. you cannot see it it's it disappears. exactly yeah well, yeah so, that was exactly his problem so he couldn't find any kind of wraparound where there would be normally at a crossover point because it had been flattened yeah. out and so the only mystery it, you can't see it in the frequency response either right so if you get no, that no. wrong then you you're gonna see some sort of discrepancy you get a big in the frequency yeah. response if you obviously if you're measuring it in a room that isn't going to do that on its own but yeah, uh, yeah. yeah but so yeah so great i mean fantastic there's That's still a few want. lumps and bumps in the low end but we think that is room based at well, the moment yeah it is room based um, because i've moved tried... I've, I've improved that by positioning the speakers within the room differently yep. and then using the trinov to, to 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 calculate that so basically we've got a problem there's two issues in the room there's one at 500 hertz which is going to be dead easy to deal with um and there's one at 140 hertz which is going to be less easy to deal with but where where we've got the phase wrap around in the listening position there's a there's a huge build up of 150 hertz in the corners at the front of the room so i need to construct some base trapping for the corners of the room to to sub to i, I don't because the trinov is kind of fixing that but i can hear the what the, another thing trinov can't fix is reverberation so you can't take a set of speakers and put them in a concert hall and then trin of it and then the reverberation disappears that's still going to be there and i can hear that 140 hertz which has been emphasized by knowing it's there now but i can hear that 140 hertz reverberating in the corners and it irritates me so i need to again go back to the source and sort the corners out um and so that will be the next step in the, the sort of evolution of the room 
Great. Interesting. I mean, and that maybe brings us to, I guess, what we could make our final topic. We've gone just over an hour for, as far as I understand. Um, but maybe just talking about actual room acoustics in combination with an Atmos system. Um, but also maybe just, uh, well, let's just stick to that for now, actually. Because you already mentioned at the beginning, I thought that was really interesting as really, really valuable and obviously um, on the on point. The fact that if you are using these speakers above you, for example, that you wouldn't, you don't just want, um, well, you basically want consistent dispersion all around, right? Yeah. And can and that's kind of that's kind of the goal, right? So yeah. um, that, uh, when we're talking about acoustics for a room, so for a speaker, or rather thinking about the acoustic response when you're designing a speaker is there a, a room response when you're designing a speaker is there are there any kind of guidelines that you knew you wanted to follow apart from the dispersion characteristics of the mid dome um driver like we, we usually we design speakers and we're not really thinking about the room all that much it seems yeah um, but is it, well, these, did any, anything creep in where you were just like, ah, actually, we need to consider this? Can you talk to me about that? These speakers were designed for us in this room without mm -hmm. the intention of selling them. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to just get them right for here. So it was basically a case of tuning them for in here to get them sounding good. Yeah, in terms really. of actual, actual design requirements for this room, um, the main one was um, that, it want, that I needed a shallow cabinet. Mm -hmm. which is is very difficult to do in terms of low end response because a base driver the back of it likes a nice big deep cabinet so to, and i didn't want to go any deeper than 200 mil eight inches that was my target in in the end we got it down to 150 so it's a little bit it's a little bit narrower but that I was just, the main i don't understand how that works but yeah yeah nor do i um <laughs> and 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 the, well, well, I kind of do a little bit now. I, I do more than I did. Uh, but that was basically down to experimentation and just mm -hmm. making a lot of cabinets with the drive. But so once we decided on the base driver, um, it was like, OK, let's get the cabinet right. So so to, to skip back a bit, what we were talking about earlier, when I when I built the first ported cabinet that worked, it sounded fantastic. And then you did the DSP for that. Mm -hmm. And then that made it sound even better. Um, and we were again being guided by the Trinov and looking at what that was doing, and that helped us out enormously. And then we ended up with a stereo pair of speakers that sounded fantastic with a superb mid range and a really nice high end, um, and a nice, tight, accurate, fast low end. We couldn't hear any artifacts from the port, it was just reinforcing the low end. When you put your ear to the port, you could just hear kind of a hundred hertz and down coming out, which is, and I was like that's what the maths works it, <laughs> ah, is it? And, yeah and i was really really happy and, and then at that point we invited lots of people in to listen and they were all like oh they looked awful but they they sounded amazing um but they just wouldn't go loud enough i was running out of headroom and i'd get to the volume level at which i was just starting to enjoy myself and then you'd hear the bass driver reaching its excursion like flapping noises. and yeah and it's like okay turn it down um so it's like right okay so we need this but louder um so we went up to an eight inch driver which in the same range because we fell in love with the the, the smaller one the sound of it was fantastic um and it's crossed over at 400 hertz so it's not doing a huge amount but it, it just sounded great it sounded really natural uh, really fast driver, really kind of well engineered. Um, so we went up to an eight inch driver. I then made three ported cabinets yep. for that, which can only be described as catastrophes. <laughs> um, one of them, there was, uh, there's the rear port was, there was so much air coming out of the port that we got some plants in the corner of the room. They were just being completely destroyed every time we got up to about 80 dB. It was like they're in a hurricane. It was ridiculous. So I Perfect redesigned the port and put it. Yeah, redesigned the port, put it around the front. That was no. I can. It's like having a hair dryer. Someone's turning on and off in my face. <laughs> that doesn't work either. Um, and that's when 
I, I got advice from people who know what they're doing in terms of speaker cabinet design. And they said, well, why don't you look at the measurements and said, well, this is just as suitable for a sealed enclosure as it is in a um, tuned in a ported enclosure, you're going to lose some SPL because you're not using the rear energy from the, from the driver, but you're probably going to get enough to have a, have a balanced system and be able to get up to the 85 dB you need to meet Dolby's requirements. Um, and you'll get a, a shallower roll-off from the low end and you won't have to worry about the artifacts of the port because there isn't one. Um, and you can, you've can you got sort of 20% leeway with the volume of the box. You can afford to get it wrong a little bit more. Um, so I tried that and got it wrong. And it's like, no, that doesn't sound... No, that sounds awful. So really went into the maths and did and 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 determined that we needed a twenty three point zero seven liter enclosure. So built that, and then forgot to allow for the width of the material we were building the cabinet out of, the size of the physical drivers in the box, <laughs> and got that wrong, and then did it again. And and basically what you see here is the sixth iteration of of this in a in a sealed enclosure to the point where I'd even calculated the volume of the cable that goes from the the, the amplifiers to the to the drivers, which is ridiculous. I hope Not- you didn't stick any like damping insulation material in the cabinet because that would have changed everything again. <laughs> yeah, well, that was the thing. I, I initially I did um, because that was the advice that I'd been given. But the, yeah, that cha- that makes the driver think it's in a bigger box than it is. Exactly. So that didn't work. So all that came out. Um, and then there was a resonance from the back panel. So this was about iteration four. So then I thought, well, why don't I stick the big circle of MDF I've cut out from the baffle? Why don't I stick that on the back? That will recycle that and stop it stop it ringing, which it didn't. Uh, well, it did, it, did a, it did a little bit, but not enough. Um, and then I used the, the kind of bitumen stuff that car uh-huh. audio guys use to line the inside of their metal doors. With, I, I just lined the cabinet with the back of the cabinet with that and just a very thin layer of foam just to give it a little bit less sort of reflection if there's any high frequency information in there, which there isn't, but but just a tiny little bit of that just to deaden it a bit more. Made the box slightly bigger to allow for that. And that was it. And then it measured really well with, with the Trinov. It sounded fantastic. We had the SPL we needed um, and it was we knew it was going to be used with subs anyway, so... But, but we knew without the subs we could get that volume that we wanted. But as soon as we added the subs in, which were then based on a on the same driver from the same range, but a bigger, a 12-inch version, again, sealed enclosure, done with the same maths. So the subs were fairly easy to, to sort out. Moving those around in the room helped with the 140 hertz issue enormously. Um, and that huge dip then became a fairly minor dip um, but again, I could still hear the I can still hear now the reverberation of that 140 hertz. So we need to go back and fix that out. So going back to the acoustics of the room and how they work in conjunction with the speaker, it's just as important as and this is why speakers used to be designed for specific studios back in the, and still are to, to the you still very few studios buy and and you know an ATC system off the shelf. Um, the new studio in the south of France that Brad Pitt's Miraval. been, yeah, Miraval. Mm-hmm. They've got ATC studios in the wall, and they've all been custom made for that that particular space. Yet they're designed on their, they're based on their standard models, but they're a custom mm. design for for that room. Um, and how the and it's all a system, as as you know. It's how the so how the driver interacts with the cabinet. That's a system, and then how that interacts with the room. That's also part of the system. And you've got to get all of those stages as right as you can in order to be able to get the best results. If one of them's wrong then it's all it's all wrong it's you've broken all yeah. of it yeah wow amazing <laughs> and i mean and, and you're literally just getting started in a way which is the craziest part of yeah, this you know? yeah yeah um you've put so much work and time into this already and in a way this is just the beginning of potentially a very very long journey um and there's so much we could still talk about i mean you've got this is the owl i believe the on wall yeah, that was a working title but i think it? it's going to stick to be honest <laughs> the, on, the on wall loudspeaker the on like, wall you know, loudspeaker well you know what my sense of humor is like it's like right we need a name uh, and i and and, and the, some of the various i, I know when james like went home at a sensible time in the evening most nights and i'd be here just 
sometimes throughout the night just <laughs> sanding something or, or um, just completely obsessed with it. And quite often I'd send you videos from my phone of the latest incarnation of the cabinet and some of the names that I'd given to some of the, the speakers are completely unrepeatable on any kind of YouTube channel. <laughs> uh, uh, and I was like, right, this one's called the arsehole. And, and I'd kind of send you that um, shortly before it, I set to it with a sledgehammer. Um, so, yeah, they've had many names over yeah. the past few months. But but yeah, so it's the, we've got the yeah, owl. The, the, the owl moment. kind of stuck. And, and then you've like got loads of people in the live stream the, the chat mom, were saying it as well. The mum. The and the mum, the modular upgradable monitor. Which I understand Sorry? is still very much uh, the mum is still very much a a, uh, a design prototype, yeah. a design so the, idea. It's not even it's not even physically yeah, yeah. manifested. So the mum yet. was actually the first monitor we came up with before these ones. Okay. Um, okay. So it's exactly the same drivers, almost the same cabinet size, but the cabinet isn't quite right at the moment. There was a mistake in the design that's um, because that's the modular thing. The volume mm -hmm. of that cabinet wasn't taken into account. The modular part that gets taken out so it's minus about five liters or so yeah um, and, and again that, and that came from putting putting these putting the mid driver and the tweeter in a box eventually so as i could evaluate them with different base loading options um mm. and then and then i thought hang on a minute there's probably a gap in the market for an upgradable monitor so you can and that's the point at which i found that the smaller version of the base driver we've been using the four inch version happens to fit in the hole that that hmm. does so i thought literally to a millimeter so you could start off with a fairly budget two-way monitor with a base driver in it and then if you wanted to go up to three-way and, and improve your monitoring as your skills progress or whatever instead of having to sell that and then buy something else and get used to the change in tonality etc 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 you can just pop the base driver out put this in and that can then slot in have a base cabinet of whatever design works for you it could be a floor stander it could be a horizontal stand mount it could be an on wall version and then you can you can so that mid and that tweeter can kind of stay with you for the rest of your career in various options of base cabinet if if other studios have them you can go around the studios with your little two-way bit and plug it into whatever base I'm taking it, mine. It, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It, yeah, it, it kind of it, that was sort of all involving as I was washing the blood off. Um, that, was, that, that was that was all kind of evolving in my twisted mind. Um, so that became the mum, the modular upgradable monitor, uh, which is still an idea I think is either just completely ridiculous and no one would ever want to buy a budget two or an upgrade, um, or is actually quite a good idea. But that's a whole marketing we'll thing, and and that's so that's one thing. So we, I don't think we're going to become a speaker manufacturer for mm -hmm. various reasons. One is because we don't really want to. Uh, someone else would need to do that, and I'm no good at marketing at all. I mean, the very fact that yeah, I'm sitting here, I mean, talk... your thumbnails and, and and headlines are pretty good. <laughs> yeah, but that's more of a that's that's a creative itch rather than yeah, any, it's still any marketing. We can, we can do the YouTube thing. I mean, the very fact that I'm sitting here now talking to you about our speakers wearing a PMC t-shirt should <laughs> kind, kind of tell you everything you need to know about my well, about You don't my need to be wearing skills. a PDP hat on every video, you know, Mark? So. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, yeah, that, yeah that's, we've got the mug. Yeah, we've got, yeah, we've got, we've got, got the mugs. We've got nice, the PDP nice. mugs. Well, but yeah, listen, I, I think YouTube is our strongest marketing thing, to be honest. Just make <laughs> videos about what we do and people seem to like that. Um, they do, I do. That seems and to be I'm a sure winner for us. it will only Thank grow. You. Um, and so, yeah, maybe this is a great point to wrap up. Um, I think there's there's so much still to to look out for, or to watch out for, to to hope for, to expect. Yeah, and just and just um, um, be 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 joyful of what is to come from your end, because I, like I just said, this is this is probably just the start of a longer journey. And there's even with yeah. what you did already, there's still so much more to talk about. We haven't even touched on the subwoofer yet um so there's there's so much still to to check out so again for everybody uh, i highly recommend you check out the video series uh that you guys did uh, describing the process uh, and there's so much in there that we didn't touch on now um i guess what's left to say for me is thank you so much for sharing this with thank me. you thanks it's for having us yeah thanks i'm for really excited us. to see where you take this um and um and wish you all the best and thank you, thank you. 
see you soon i guess talk soon maybe we'll we'll do another video when uh when the the mom is out or when the 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 full yeah. stack sub needs needs another video we'll see yeah but yeah for now uh mark james thanks for joining me and uh see you soon. thanks jesco cheers thank you thank you so much bye, -bye.